Uh, well, thank you very much indeed for the introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you all this evening. Um, obviously, uh, speaking as a member of the British Armed Forces, uh, a, a very special day today, uh, being remembrance um, and uh, an honour to be able to, to join you this evening. Uh, to talk about this most interesting um, of subjects. Um, so what I'm going to do is talk for about uh, uh, well, 50 minutes to an hour or so, and then we'll open things up for, for Q&A. As Tony said, if you want to pop your questions in the Q&A box, and we'll get to those later on, I'm not going to monitor that um, uh, during the talk, um, uh, but we'll just see how we go. Okay. Um, now, hopefully, uh, everyone will appreciate for um, very obvious reasons. Um, there are certain things that I will talk about, and there are probably a number of things I won't talk about. Um, most of the material that you'll see uh, on the presentation is gleaned from open source uh, sources. Um, it's, it's, uh, yes, I will do. Thank you. Uh, it's uh, unclassified, therefore. Um, pop this off and save some bandwidth. There we go. Okay. Um, there are, uh, there, there are uh, for those who, who maybe have further interest, uh, there are potentially other things I'm, I'm you know, potentially in a position to share, uh, but, but not via these means. Um, but, uh, you know, hopefully off the, the back of this, uh, I'll be able to give you a bit of an idea. Okay, so um, this gentleman obviously has quite a keen interest in, in all things subterranean, and we will come back to him in due course. Um, but to start with, what I'd like to do is just to explain a little bit about uh, where I fit into the, the broader uh, British Army approach to uh, subterranea. Uh, and fundamentally, that's part or, or in charge of the, the military geology cell. Now, that sounds terribly grand, um, but the reality is that it's, there are only three of us. Um, now, the military geology cell sits, with, sits within 66 Works Group, um, which is a Royal Engineers unit, uh, the Sappers, and we sit within 8 Engineer Brigade. It's obviously part of the, the broader British Army. Um, what do we do? Uh, well, we do a large number of things. Um, we are all, uh, we're all reservists, I should add, and we all have individual skill sets, experience um, from having worked in industry, academia, and for government. And that enable us to do our job and to deliver a, an effect on, on behalf of Her Majesty's government through the, the military armed forces, of course. Um, we may look at resources. We may look at geohazards. Uh, we may look at uh, engineering aspects, uh, terrain analysis, resilience. And by that, I mean uh, you know, in a UK resilience context, uh, things like uh, even, even uh, supporting aspects around COVID. Um, and obviously, subterranean. Um, so the experience that we bring to bear, um, as I said, industry, academia, government. Um, but how do we go about doing our business? Uh, well, we can provide advice, uh, technical advice or, or, or the like on site. We can do it uh, via correspondence you know, and be that over the phone uh, very quickly, immediately, uh, or, or via email. So there's lots of ways that we can, in effect, deliver that, uh, that utility, that, that, that um, effect to defence. In terms of our competencies, uh, all military geologists hold a geology degree, and most have specialist master's uh, degrees or, or indeed a doctorate. Um, fundamentally, we are able to source and compile and rapidly digest that information, um, take out the techno speak, uh, and provide it in a digestible form uh, to um, the chain of command such that it can inform decision making or, or again, deliver an effect. Um, where we differ from uh, regular geologists, if I may call them that, is that we have the military background to complement uh, our, uh, let's say, the civilian uh, professional competencies. And on that professionalism, uh, most of us will be chartered geologists or chartered engineers, or indeed both, uh, and more than likely affiliated to one of the organizations you see opposite. Uh, I've mentioned already education uh, and experience, the academic aspects, uh, where we've studied. We may come with a, a particular uh, set of, of knowledge, skills, and, and experience, uh, depending on the, the degree we've done uh, and the experience therein. Uh, from industry, whether it's in mining, whether it's in science, you know, one of our, our geologists in more recent years has actually uh, you know, been the proverbial rocket scientist uh, and has done some work with, with NASA, for example. And then militarily, uh, whilst we are 
usually Royal Engineers. It actually happens to be that one of my officers, one of the two majors who uh, make up the team along with myself, is actually an infantry cat badge. And that's quite exceptional. And there are reasons for that that I won't bore you with. Um, but normally it's three Royal Engineers officers. Um, but we will plug in and we will have broader military experience, experience from across a number of other organisations. And it's that experience, depth and breadth of experience, that allows us to do our job effectively sat in the middle of a, a broader pool of specialists within 170 infrastructure support group. Um, and I should add that that, is, that, that, that brings in both uh, regular army and army reserve elements. Army reserve being the, the new name has been for some time now for what was the territorial army. Um, but again, that allows us to then uh, link into and work alongside and, and dovetail with intelligence, uh, government, industry, academia, and, and all the rest of it. And fundamentally, we plug into operations and plans uh, and then things like capability development and, and training as well. So we are, we are, to a certain extent, a, a small cog in a very, very big machine. Now, for those of you who would like to learn a little bit more about the background of the geologists, uh, there are a number of very well-written papers um, by uh, previous uh, senior army geologists. Uh, those are, are highlighted on this slide, and obviously you can uh, go back to the recording of this and, and pick those out. Um, if anybody, if you... If you can't track those down, I'll be delighted to pass those details on. But most of those are all in the uh, the, the core journal, the, the Royal Engineers Journal, uh, and that takes you right back to the you know pre-war era, right the way through to to modern day. Part five, uh, due to be published very shortly. Uh, in terms of what we do uh, within the military geology cell, um, there are a number of things. We can provide support looking at materials. We can help to source and then develop water resources, uh, water development. Uh, we can work to develop minerals and, and perhaps pertinently right now uh, are looking potentially at strategic resources. Uh, that's not to say the British Army is going to go out and start mining. But what we might need to do is understand where those materials are, whether they are strategic in nature and fundamentally whether um, Great Britain uh, or any of our allies need to, to have those or have access to those. Um, so having an understanding of the economic geology principles is quite key. And certainly a number of those documents, uh, so one example here to on the right hand side, you know, we do a lot of uh, crystal ball gazing and looking over the horizon. Um, uh, you know, and strategic resources is certainly a, a very pertinent issue and, and probably reinforced by what we're seeing going on at COP26 in Glasgow right now. Certainly the, the, the surge in energy, uh, or should I say green technology uh, related raw materials. Uh, we will also uh, work, with, uh, work, work with and for uh, sustaining the training estate um, where our soldiers, airmen and uh, naval uh, uh, colleagues uh, work, um, live, uh, train, etc. Uh, that may be in Kenya, it may be something like the Rock of Gibraltar, it could be on the plains of Salisbury. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. But we will uh, provide some semblance of support. You know, fundamentally, anything there is either in or on top of the geology. We will look at infrastructure. We will look at how that infrastructure is affected by geology, and we will provide guidance as to how that infrastructure affects operations. Uh, and uh, I'll mention to Terry Law in terms of resilience, um, on occasions uh, when requested to do so, we can provide MACA support, so military assistance to the civilian authorities. So whether that's uh, uh, something like uh, floods uh, or indeed some of the photos you see uh, shown there, one of those um, was in 2013 of the Dolish landslide um, where I was called out at very short notice to go down and support rail track uh, as they tried to work out what to do about a very large landslide that had come down across the, uh, the railway. Uh, and we'll also plug into defence intelligence, and, and for obvious reasons I'm not going to go too far into the details there. Geohazards is another area, um, whether it is uh, climate change related or not, um, you will see the incidences, be it sort of tropical cyclones, hurricanes, tsunamis, earthquakes and so on and so forth. Obviously a lot of volcanoes seem to be uh, kicking off right now 
And it might be that whether it's uh, an overseas territory that uh, Britain is closely affiliated with, or indeed one of our allies, we may very well be called upon to provide some, some semblance of support. And finally, uh, we may be called in to look at aspects around subterranean, and that need, leads me neatly on to my, my talking about uh, subterranean specifically. So, fundamentally, there's nothing really new about uh, subterranean, uh, subterranean or underground warfare. I, I will generally use the terms subterranean and, and underground interchangeably, um, so just to be to be clear on that. But if we back look back through history, uh, there are ample uh, examples. Uh, jump forward into contemporary history. Uh, whether it's the Tora Bora of Afghanistan, numerous examples around uh, uh, the sort of Levant, the, the Mesopotamian plains and the like. Uh, Israel, as you, you heard on your last presentation from uh, Daphne Rich and Barrack, uh, cross-border tunnels in Mexico, etc., etc. The, the, these are, he, you know, we're seeing these uh, increase uh, 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 you know, year on year in terms of their use, and I'll go into the reasons for that shortly. Now, just to look back to last time, I just mentioned uh, Dr. Daphne. Um, you know, I was slightly, slightly uh, 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 struck by golly, I've got to follow uh, the the, uh, the doctor who literally wrote the book on underground warfare a, a, a small month later, um, and therefore uh, really good to 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 see what she had to say. And I, I think when you looked at the the slide she presented shown here with the trends and you see the, the significant increase in the use of subterranea or underground for warfare over recent years that that's quite a telling point um as i said lots of uh historical examples uh, numerous examples out there uh, going back to um bc right the way through to more recent years um, but fundamentally, this is where we start to see the sort of Royal Engineers side of things come into, in, into play. So the Royal Engineers trace their origins back to the military engineers brought to England by William the Conqueror. Um, if we look uh, back far enough um, in Woolwich in, in 1716, uh, the board formed the Royal Regiment of Artillery and established the Corps of, en of Engineers. So it wasn't that long ago that we were actually uh, celebrating um, some, some fairly significant uh, anniversaries. Um, a lot of service, certainly places like Gibraltar, we'll, we'll touch upon that in due course. Um, but uh, you know, in 1820, the unit's name was changed to the Corps of Royal Sappers and Miners. If we jump forward, let me get my slides to work here. There we go. If we jump forward to um, pre-World uh, pre War One, uh, a couple of photos here demonstrating the Royal Engineers uh, practicing blowing mines uh, down near Chatham and Kent. Uh, the photo on the, um, on, on the left from uh, 1887 uh, and the photo on the left from a British siege exercise again at Chatham uh, in 1907. Some of those charges relatively small, 200, uh, to 250 pounds of gun of gunpowder of, of, of their amounts, and not significantly larger large charges. Um, but obviously, if we jump forward, actually into the thick of it, uh, into World War One, and this gentleman, uh, <coughs> uh, Norton Griffiths, um, who came up with the idea of utilising the, the civilian experts that he had, he was using in. Um, in Manchester and other locations around England for, for putting in sewers and, and the like um, to, to commence uh, tunnel warfare uh, on the Western Front. And we see numerous examples of that being, uh, of that being applied. Um, frankly, the shock and awe effect of some of these ex significant charges being in place, um, the expertise be for, for tunneling and, and numerous other counter tunneling techniques being utilized. Uh, this this chap here on the, the right hand side shown using a geophone to try and detect uh, enemy tunnels, um, and we saw significant use, uh, for example, uh, here in June 1917, with over 25 mines being laid, some 19 of those exploding, uh, many of those others unexploded, uh, remain unexploded, obviously under the Western Front, but a significant um, uh, offensive in this particular case. 
and yet uh, often forgotten and, and actually rather fascinating in its own right was the front, uh, the Italian front, uh, the Hungarian Austrians um, fighting at that time uh, against the Italians. And I was lucky enough to visit the front um, back in, uh, in in the summer of uh, 2019 um, after a conference um, to visit a number of these sites. This is this is Monte Piano, and you can sell you can see just by here, uh, just to a certain extent, just how barren and exposed that landscape is. High alpine. Um, rock-strewn slopes, very severe, rugged uh, uh, topography in, in, in places. Uh, and you'll note in a number of the slides, I've actually annotated uh, in the yellow box what the geology is. In this case, medium to hard sedimentary rocks, limestone, dolomites predominantly. And therefore, and, and the so what from that is to think about, well, how easily could the tunneling have been done here? Obviously, this is more of a trench system, but there are a significant number of tunnels uh, at Monte Piano. But if we look through the broader um, Italian front, we also see the utilization of ice tunnels, what I would deem to be cryospheric warfare, as opposed to subterranean warfare. Um, both sides utilizing the glacial um, glacial areas, um, open crevasses to, to, to gain access and for, for passageway, as well as actually opening up those tunnels themselves. And indeed, there's some quite interesting maps and, and, and plans um, available. And if you note the, the section here, A to B, I'll just pop up the next slide there, and I'm just going to cut to my notes just so I can get this right. So this gentleman, the <coughs> left-hand side, is, is Leo Candle. Uh, Leo Handel, excuse me. Uh, so he was born in Innsbruck in, uh, in 1887, studied civil engineering, and became an enthusiastic mountaineer. So he was ideal for this, uh, this, this environment. In 1914, he transferred to the Dolomite Front, and it was using his knowledge of the sector, uh, and specifically the Marmalada Glacier, um, where they actually landed up building this, this city of ice beneath the glacier um, during his time commanding the 9th Mountain Guide Company of the 2nd Alpini Regiment. Um, now, following the war, um, he, he worked as an engineer and architect, but he very much continued his study of the, the glaciers. And, and again, just to, to highlight that section there, um, back, back a slide. There we go. You see the the, the excuse my my uh, my German the glacier the, the glacier and the fells the rock and that same section shown here um, across the plan. Uh, and what's actually quite interesting in in, in the Alps just now uh, it's sad but it's interesting is with a glacial retreat uh, attributed to climate change. We're actually seeing a number of these sites being explode, exposed uh, slowly but surely uh, and, and giving up their, uh, their, their secrets, which is a like, rather sad but rather fascinating in its own right. Um, fundamentally, the mining techniques being used in the, the Italian Australian, uh, Austrian, Austrian, that's very wrong, uh, Austrian front, uh, uh, pretty straightforward for the time. But some of the engineering was really quite remarkable. Um, a few examples uh, shown here. Um, but if we get into a particular example, uh, if you note the, the, the red X uh, shown in the photo here, this is taken from one area where there are uh, extensive uh, workings, uh, a place called Sink Tori, the, the five teeth, um, viewed back the other way. I took the photo for where, from where the, um, uh, the that little uh, yellow diamond is. Um, but this was a significant uh, area of underground mining both by, by both sides. Um, accessible from the flanks and indeed from, from the surface. This is accessing from, from the top. You go down through a trench system and then you drop into the top of a spur and go down into the tunnel system. And that tunnel system actually snakes its way down the inside of the mountain, that dashed yellow highlighted uh, line. Uh, and yet there was an alternative countermining tunnel coming up from effectively the sort of lower left hand corner. And the piles of scree spoil that you see on the side, on, on the base of the slope. Uh, were both uh, the effects of that tunneling and indeed the mines, the explosive mines that were detonated by both sides uh, to, tie, to try and interdict each other's uh, tunnels. So this is the Lagazui site, um, really quite fascinating. So we jump forward in time, uh, so World War II um, and the utilization of, of, of tunnels, uh, not necessarily on the front, but for home homeland resilience. And in this case, the Ramsgate tunnels, many of you might have been down there, um, both utilizing existing railway infrastructure and newly built tunnels in order to provide the, uh, 
uh, the, the, the safe spaces for the civilian population. And, and clearly a number of other underground facilities uh, scattered around the south coast, indeed scattered throughout the country, uh, that were utilised for you know, even either civilian um, shelter or, or um, military emplacements. If I recall correctly, fan bay tunnels uh, actually sit underneath a, a anti-aircraft uh, establishment. They were also used for command and control. And there's been some really good work done for sort of British English heritage recently capturing 3D surveys of these uh, these sites, which is which is really good to see. Good to see that information preserved. Uh, and yet, uh, half a world away, uh, we have Iwo Jima, um, where the Japanese had ample time to spend um, months and months tunneling away into the, uh, the, the, the relatively soft to, to medium sedimentary and volcanic rocks uh, on the island. Um, a, a, a rather um, horrific environment to which to in which to be to be mining. Um, anecdotal um, comments saying that expo the, the Japanese soldiers were exposed to 30 to 50 degrees Celsius temperatures, uh, as well as sulfur fumes. And as I said, there's a good 18 kilometers of tunnels were in placed into Iwo Jima prior to the U.S. Marine landings uh, in in uh, in March uh, 1945. So let's jump forward again and <coughs> into the Cold War era now. Um, and uh, we have bunkers, um, nuclear bunkers, uh, starting to uh, be built. Uh, this is the Greenbrier Resort uh, bunker in the United States. It was a fallout bunker rather than a nuclear bunker. But this was designed and, and actually stayed secret um, for a great many years and was designed to be the alternative seat of government um, for, 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 for the United States. And what was really remarkable about this site was that it actually remained in, in use and was to all intents and purposes uh, hiding in plain sight. And actually its cover was really only blown um, in 1992 when a reporter um, wrote an article for the Washington Post. Up until that point, uh, that site was in effect operational. Um, you can see the photo of the blast door that um, rather interesting um, wallpaper. Uh, the resort does still look a little bit like that. It's um, uh, quite a eclectic taste, shall we say. Um, but that blast door was actually hidden by a, a, a wooden frame that could be rapidly removed and that door closed very quickly. And if you go through those double doors, you actually go through into a conference center. So the, 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 the bunker space itself was actually used day to day by the hotel for conferences. Um, as I say, hiding in plain sight, really rather fascinating. Um, another obvious one um, from that era, um, Ku Chi in Vietnam. Um, I'm, I'm sure you're all aware of the, the background to that. Um, my my top tip on that, uh, having visited there, is uh, don't take your wife there on her honeymoon. Um, I think she's just about forgiven me, but um, she wasn't that too impressed. Anyway, very I thought it was very interesting, nevertheless. Um, but just useful to think about scale. Um, so I'm about six foot. I used to play prop forward, and I can assure you that I do not fit down that through that little access hole. Uh, and therefore, you, one has to start thinking about who is the most appropriate person uh, to go down a hole um, physically and mentally. And, and that was one of the great challenges that the American troops had in terms of um, how they were, uh, should, I should say, American and um, Australian troops um, about their the work that they did to counter the tunnels uh, in, in Coochie. So... So another part of the world, not too far from that uh, in reality, uh, North Korea, uh, obviously a number of tunnels have been found there, four main tunnels, um, but more recently um, in the media, um, quite significant media around um, the North Koreans demolishing, uh, purportedly demolishing some of their nuclear research underground facilities, uh, which is the, the photos on the, on the right hand side of the slide there. Um, but the fact remains that there's probably a significant number of, of sites uh, in North Korea that we perhaps uh, ought to be concerned about. Um, but a lot of the examples I've given you are, are, are in effect, thinking about other people utilizing tunnels um, offensively. Um, and what I'd like to do now is to touch very quickly on a rather fascinating example of where we, the Western world, were using tunnels ourselves. 
Um, so obviously this is not all about Tom Hanks. Uh, I just used that photo there. This is the 2015 Bridge of Spies film, uh, tied through to, to Francis Gary Powers having been shot down uh, in 1960. Um, but what was going on above ground um, had been preceded by what had been going on below ground, um, certainly in terms of espionage involving both the CIA and, fascinating from my side, the Royal Engineers. So <coughs> intelligence had come to light uh, our, uh, informing uh, the CIA and the, the KGB and the, uh, the East uh, German um, uh, security services had uh, there were cables running uh, on the far side of a road just across um, the, the sector border in, in Berlin. Uh, and so, um, long story short, um, the CIA brought in a specialist or trained and developed a specialist team uh, to come in and dig horizontally underneath that ground. Um, it transpired that they had, to, they had to go much more shallow uh, than they anticipated because they hit the water table uh, much higher. Um, and a Royal Engineers specialist team were brought in to, to develop a piece of equipment. Uh, they called it the mole uh, originally, um, that actually bored the shaft, did a, effectively a raised bore, uh, to get up to um, only a couple of feet below surface beneath that road um, so that they could actually create a chamber and tap into those cables. And it's really a fa quite a fascinating story. And you hear some of the anecdotal um, stories around that um, such as uh, the, the gentleman you see there with, uh, with his plow was an East German farmer who owned the orchard that you see at the end of that dashed line projecting from the compound that was purportedly a warehouse and actually obscured or, or disguised as a radar monitoring station by the, by, um, the, the CIA. Um, and the, the farmer anecdotally commented that a number of his trees didn't really grow very well along a particular line. And... Further to that, there was also an, a, a story uh, during a particularly uh, rapid onset cold spell um, whereby snowfall uh, generally lay around most of the, uh, the, the orchard area and yet there was a very clear melted patch again aligned with the tunnel uh, and it transpired that there was actually sufficient en uh, heat within the tunnel that was uh, making that bit of ground that little bit warmer and melting the snow. So the team had to rapidly apply uh, or, or, or build and install uh, refrigerating units to, to lower the temperature. Um, so I thought it was a really interesting way where we used um, tunneling uh, offensively um, in the espionage set. And there's a few photos there showing the work ongoing. Uh, and indeed the Royal Engineers team, uh, led by Major Merrill and, and Major White. A really fascinating story. So back to the bigger picture. So we look around the world right now, we've looked at lots of historical examples. Indeed, there are lots of infrastructure examples in modern day life, things like the London Underground, where we have extensive underground uh, systems in, in the urban environment. Um, but if we look across China, North Korea, Iran, Pakistan, Russia, uh, it's probably fair to say and, uh, that there's probably in excess of 10,000 uh, underground facilities of some scale or form uh, across those five countries. And also, uh, if you look at all those other red dots, numerous examples of, of contemporary examples of where subterranean uh, underground features of some form or other um, are, are having to be contested with either by the military or uh, the, um, uh, yeah, the, the police or other um, government services. So what we'll do is we'll start to look at a few of those, but fundamentally, why, why have we seen this resurgence? Well, as as Professor Richmond Barrick has said, subterranean warfare has been a feature for as long as war itself has existed. Now, the British Army, like all militaries, churns out numerous documentation thinking about, well, what's going to happen in the next five years, 10 years, 20 years? Um, and fundamentally, and, and many commentators outside of the military also comment on this, we are, we are headed towards more conflict um, focused around the urban operating environment a literal, uh, particularly in the literal zone, i.e. Uh, close to water, you're on the coast, uh, certainly next to rivers. Um, and that's a very complicated environment because obviously there's a lot of people there. And that's one of the key drivers why people are going there. I, I should add that subterranean warfare mine, environments are not exclusive to urban. And certainly, hopefully, as you've seen so far, and we'll go further through, 
you'll see that be it mountain, alpine, jungle, urban, mountain, desert, arctic, coastal, jungle, whatever it happens to be, there is the possibility across, frankly, all geology types and all, all, all rock types and therefore all soft to hard rocks to encounter a subterranean feature. But why underground? Well, fundamentally, it's all about survivability. Um, so this is a, a model uh, used militarily, often referenced, uh, the survivability onion. So don't be there, be identified, be acquired, engaged, hit, penetrated, affected. And by going underground, you can address a good number of those. Now, this is perhaps most exemplified when looking, uh, or, or the rationale for that is, is, is very well illustrated here by uh, the penetration depths of a n numerous uh, munitions that uh, are on the market, let's say right now, um, in excess of, of 10 meters penetration in, in some particular cases. Um, but whether it is military forces or whether it is civilians, they are being driven underground because of that survivability. Don't be seen, don't be penetrated and therefore affected. And you can see this just by looking at the devastation of some of these urban environments, especially during uh, the modern era. Uh, this is Kobani in, in, in Syria in 2014. You can see the utter levels of devastation uh, above surface. So this is driving people underground. Now, some of these features are, are built from scratch. Uh, many of them, indeed, are uh, pre-existing features that might have been there for, for even millennia uh, that are being repurposed. Um, but that's for people to, to um, be safe, uh, it's for underground facilities such as hospitals and the like and, 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 and things like that. Um, <coughs> but if we look more broadly at uh, Iraq and Syria, excuse me, a quick drink, um, we're seeing some, we, we have seen some really interesting things emerging. Um, and this is just one example. Um, we've seen all scales of tunnels uh, being um, discovered uh, throughout Iraq and Syria. Everything from the very, very narrow um, soldier-wide system through to these improvised tunnel boring machines and, and what they're capable of doing. And, in, and indeed, any various forces repurposing um, civil engineering equipment, road headers and, and, and the like. Um, and we've seen that right across the area. And indeed, some of those underground facilities are significant in size. You can look at this photo and you can see the level of engineering and you can see the level of investment that's gone into that, uh, the steel, the cement, uh, the engineering know-how that would have had to have been applied for this you know, multi-level system. And indeed, we have come full circle in terms of the utilization of, of mines. Um, a couple of examples shown here, um, mostly around Aleppo, uh, where mines were emplaced um, in relatively soft uh, to medium geology, chalk, marls, limestones. So relatively easy digging, if, uh, if you excuse, excuse that simplification. Um, but the shock, uh, and dare I say, awe effect uh, psychologically of, of such attacks on, on, on the forces is, is, is significant. Um, and, and I think Daphne referenced those when she spoke last, uh, last month. Um, Remiss not to, to talk about uh, Israel. I'm not going to dwell too heavily on that. Um, Daphne obviously talked about that. But if you split out into the north and the south, Gaza certainly softer geology, sedimentary alluvium sands. Uh, but the geology in the north, uh, much harder, um, dolomite and limestones. Uh, and that's particularly where we saw the Zaret uh, cross-border tunnel. Uh, I won't dwell heavily on that because, as I said, that was mentioned last month. But a really fascinating site to see the level of expertise, technical insight that, had, that would have gone into developing that. Uh, and indeed, the Israeli Defense Force trains extensively for, the, for these, um, these operations, uh, in this particular case, using underground uh, infrastructure um, uh, beneath Tel Aviv. Uh, and just by looking at that photo, you can take away a number of, uh, a number of things, looking at the, the use of an underground, uh, uh, sorry, an unmanned uh, robot, or uh, UGV, a robot um, and the equipment that they're using, you know, a high, but, but operating in a tunnel where there's high voltage cables, uh, possibly other data cables and utilities, you know, is very sort of uh, key to think about as well. So, um, 
the slightly uh, fictional, um, over-egged uh, imagination of uh, Bin Laden's former mountain fortress, perhaps, courtesy of the Daily Mail. But, but the, nevertheless, there are significant underground structures uh, scattered throughout Afghanistan. Um, some of those go back and, and predate the Soviet invasion um, and occupation, uh, but nevertheless, the Mujahideen uh, um, utilized those to great effect and, and subsequently... Uh, regrettably, we, we've seen what the Taliban have, have similarly done with those underground uh, facilities. Um, more recent examples, the Battle of Marawi. Um, fairly recently and uh, extensive use made within that uh, city or in parts of that city, utilizing cellars, um, sewers to enable movement, uh, both by the Philippine forces and the, the Islamic insurgents. Um, and, and again, a situation where above ground there was utter devastation. Um, if we look uh, more broadly, and again, this is this is all open source material that I, I have gleaned, but it's very interesting to, to look around and see what some of the, the major states around the world are doing, uh, developing facilities, in this case, uh, the Chinese Navy and their utilization of underground uh, tunnels or facilities. Uh, one particular example here, the Yulin uh, Naval Base, um, which uh, hopefully you can read the slide there, but you can see the, the different red dots signifying above ground pieces of infrastructure which are supporting the underground system. This is all open source uh, intelligence, the sort of Bellingcat type, type research, which uh, we see a great deal of these days. But it's really fascinating to see just what you can interpret from uh, uh, imagery uh, just on its own. Uh, that's not to say that they, they're, they're the first to do this, and indeed, uh, very topical, but if we look closer to home, we look at Sweden, um, they developed a significant uh, naval underground facility uh, back in the, the 50s and 60s, uh, and have actually just recently moved their naval headquarters back into this uh, site that they took out of Mothball, um, because it obviously offers significant protection, um, both for uh, headquarters elements, as well as, as you can see, I'm not a ship expert. That looks something like a frigate to me. It's obviously a significant size uh, vessel. Uh, and maybe that lower in, lower uh, image there gives you a bit of an indication as to, to what the access is like and the size of vessels that might be able to get, to, to get in there. Very quick look at uh, urban infrastructure. As I said earlier on, uh, the, the forecasters envision more conflict uh, around the urban environment. Now, that's certainly not to say, hopefully nobody's dialing in from Canada right now, it's not to say that uh, Toronto's uh, about to descend into to warfare, but what this really illustrates is um, in certain areas around the world, there really is significant uh, underground urban infrastructure. Um, the, the path network in in Toronto is a, a good example here where you can go from Lakeshore to uh, Dundas Square over two kilometers um, purely underground um, where there are uh, restaurants, cinemas, car parks and a whole myriad of other functions sat beneath the central business district. And, and these are things that we need to consider when we're going into, uh, into operations from a military perspective because whilst Toronto is a relatively modern city if we look at the likes of Paris or we look at Rome, for example, there are uh, millennia old catacombs and other structures there, and uh, which similarly could act as pathways and conduits for the movement of, of uh, military personnel or materials, or, or, or indeed um, could house uh, civilians. And it's worth highlighting uh, the legal aspects around what we can and cannot do in, in such circumstances. Can we assure ourselves of the fact that it is uh, safe to uh, commence a military operation on a subterranean structure and the knowledge that it uh, does not hold uh, uh, civilians. So these are all considerations. Um, slightly different um, theme here. This is uh, Op Harpy, uh, the French military operating in South America. Um, now this um, is a counter mining operation, mining as in gold mining. Um, where the Gampineros uh, are doing significant damage to the environment, their utilization of um, very damaging techniques, hydraulicking to, to wash the, the gold out of the, the, the weathered saprolitic rock, the weathered rock, um, and then crushing the rock and then using uh, chemicals like cyanide and mercury to extract the gold. So the French military have been operating for them for, for some time now. 
Uh, regrettably, a couple of years ago, they lost four soldiers underground going down one of these artisanal mines. Uh, and hence the photo you see on the left there, the soldier descending uh, on a safety rope with self-contained breathing apparatus. And these are some of the risks that certainly come to, you know, uh, you know that we have to, 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 to address when operating in these environments. Uh, lots of examples from the Mexico-US uh, border. Uh, I'm sure you've all seen those in, in the media. Some of those are actually quite sophisticated uh, and probably worth highlighting again. The level of technical competency and the level of investment that's gone into building these structures. Um, so where does that leave us? Well, these are some of the challenges that I, I would uh, offer we have when looking at subterranean warfare. Fundamentally, in my mind at least, it boils down to detect and deny. How can we find these, these, these uh, linear features, these facilities, these structures, these, these mission spaces, whatever you want to call them, and, and then how can we deny them? And that denial, don't forget, might not necessarily be hitting it from a very high altitude with a very large bomb. We might not be able to do that. Uh, it might be very simple. I might be able to deny a space by physically occupying it with soldiers myself, or I might want to deny it to enemy forces just by turning a pump off turning a piece of infrastructure off, which means that space becomes unusable. Other challenges, and, and clearly there's a geology aspect in there. Um, how might I survey those spaces? There's a geology uh, aspect to that. Communication. How do we understand these things from an intelligence point of view? How do we operate logistically in an underground space? Uh, LOAC, the Law of Armed Conflict, um, very, high, very well highlighted by... Um, uh, on, on your last presentation, um, how can we, because we are bound by those, those rules, how can we uh, conduct our operations um, safely? Um, what weapon systems can we and can we not use? Again, there's a geology aspect to that. Psychology, not everybody is suited to working in these confined spaces. How do we get people out? How do we train people and how do we navigate? And I'll, I'll go into a couple more of these in a little bit more detail. Um, but certainly in terms of the psychology and the Kazavak, I thought it was very topical seeing the news this week uh, of the uh, cave rescue in the Brecon Beacons um, when you had some 250 um, rescuers involved for getting that one chap out. Quite significant. I think that's going to be interesting as the more news comes out about that. But you have to start thinking of the not just the, the logistics of the people down there, but how do you support them and keep them safe. Um, in terms of training, i um, seen a little bit about this in, in the media recently. I Indeed, I saw Subterranean Britannica retweet something about the Royal Marines the other, the other week. Um, it is a training site. It is being used. Um, very obviously, there are sensitivities to that site, um, but we have a large number of troops now utilizing that space uh, to develop their understanding of uh, operating in the underground environment. Now, Corsham Mine itself has a long history, uh, both in terms of its, its origin as a mine for, for, for dimension stone for construction, um, and then through to, in effect, the parallel of the Greenbrier Resort that I mentioned all, uh, earlier on, um, where we had a significant bunker um, you know, for the purposes of carrying on uh, government functions. So really quite a fascinating, a fascinating site through the years. And obviously Gibraltar as well. Numerous phases of underground development there um, going back centuries. And clearly a Royal Engineers involvement there, and we're incredibly proud of that. Um, but we are now utilizing some of the underground spaces uh, in Gibraltar, um, putting those into use for our training. Indeed, some of those underground spaces have already been returned to the government of Gibraltar and are being used for, for uh, other, other purposes as well. Um, some of you may have been following this, a really interesting uh, program which ran for probably the best part of three years, culminating in, probably a couple of months ago, the, the DARPA Subterranean Challenge. Uh, they were looking at um, what systems, uh, be they, well, you see a number of their robots, robo, robo dogs, uh, UAVs, UGVs, uh, could be used uh, working collaboratively and semi-independently in these underground environments. And they, they gave three problem sets. Um, do this in a tunnel environment. Think of a um, um, uh, you know, man-made man sort of rural tunnel. 
uh, an urban environment, think subways, basements, and then a natural cave environment. And they, they put these bits of kit to, to task. And there's some really fascinating videos on YouTube if you have the time. Uh, going to see what the going to see what the different teams did um, in terms of uh, you know, applying the the computing power, the you know, the artificial intelligence, the machine learning, the the lidar scanning, and all these bits of kit and putting them together into these systems really quite fascinating. Um, and innovation is a big thing. Um, and my my background is actually in the mining sector, and and to a certain extent, a lot of this we're we're doing in the mining sector as well. Um, so this is not, a, shall I say, an exclusive problem from the military uh, point of view. Um, minor, miners, you know, operate in a, in a high, high threat, a high risk environment underground. So whether some of these systems are being used to um, gather information about the, the, the voids, the spaces we're working in, uh, to go ahead, um, you know, certainly ahead of a human or, or a military, certainly ahead of perhaps a military working dog, for example, uh, we can use these things and we can develop these data sets and we can use these to better visualize uh, the, the problem that we have. So that's me nearly finished here. I'm just going to leave you with this quote, which I'll let you read. I'll take a little drink and uh, we'll, we'll move on to questions uh, just shortly. So hopefully you've all had a chance to read that, but it reiterates one of my earlier comments. There's nothing new about this, um, but um, you know it's not something that we can we we can ignore and we we must get after. Um, so a little bit of further reading, should you be interested, um, some really good books out there. Uh, certainly, definitely Richmond Barracks, uh, 2018, Underground Warfare is probably the go-to. Um, uh, technical overview right now, but lots of good stuff for, for historical context. Uh, Simon Jones and his Underground Warfare, uh, 14 to 18 books, very good for obviously the World War One stuff. Um, the story I gave you uh, earlier on from Berlin, the CIA and the Royal Engineers, uh, is very well um, laid out in Steve uh, Vogel's Betrayal in Berlin. Uh, a really fascinating story. It's more of an espionage story, but the, the tunnel is part of that. And then if you're getting into the military geosciences, there are numerous publications out there. Uh, and indeed, as the secretary to the International Association of Military Geosciences, it would be remiss of me if I didn't flag the uh, existence of such an organization. I should add it's free to join. Just contact me and I'll add you to the mailing list. Um, but we do run a biennial conference, uh, the next of which is going to be hosted in Charleston, South Carolina uh, next summer. And I think... That is me. So as long as I don't break the system now, I'm going to bring up Q&A and then we'll crack on with that. So um, thank you so much um, for your time. Let me see. Um, I shall pop my camera back on as well so you can see me. Um, well, let's see. I'm just going to scroll to the top. Um, first question, a recent cave rescue, texting through the rock. Golly. Um, I'm not exactly too sure, but I am aware of a number of systems, um, some of which have been in use for quite a number of years, um, whereby signals can be communicated down um, through significant rock masses. Um, the other way of doing that would be to actually lay a cable, uh, potentially a, a, a wire cable, a metal cable, uh, or something like a fiber optic cable uh, through which to communicate a signal from surface uh, down underground. Um, okay, slide six, TLA, three-lettered abbreviation for the MGC. So the military geology cell is the MGC. So that's the, the three geologists who serve in the British Army. As I said, we're all reservists. And there's myself as a lieutenant colonel, and there are two majors. Um, okay, next question. Does the UK have a reserve of the materials mentioned in slide nine? Uh, well, good question. Um, so the UK, um, you know, clearly uh, in the past had extensive uh, mining sector, um, whether it was mining coal, um, a number of other commodities. You've only got to look at uh, areas down in, in Cornwall, for example, um, to see the history, the history there. And perhaps topical to look at the number of companies who are currently in the stock market uh, looking for a variety of commodities down there. 
uh, tin, uh, certainly the price of tin has skyrocketed lately. Uh, the price of copper is not doing too badly, and both of those commodities are being sought uh, in Cornwall. And another one that uh, topically uh, feeds into the um, uh, the whole um, uh, COP26 uh, green technology uh, and the like is lithium. Uh, and there's uh, at least one company is looking for lithium down in, in Cornwall. So uh, there are some materials we have in the UK, um, but there are many that we don't. Uh, so we do need to think very carefully about where our supplies will come from in the future. Uh, let's see, strategic resources, number of years left diagram. Um, I'm not going to dwell too heavily on that that uh, question, uh, Hillary. Um, I think I've probably kind of answered that in terms of the, the economics and minerals and the like. Um, have you experienced a report of military tunnels in Switzerland from one valley to another through the mountains? Well, um, I, in the past, have been to, to Switzerland, uh, long past. I remember one school trip going through some of the tunnels there. And more recently, I've actually been to Austria and visited the Austrian military and some of the training that they're doing there. Um, a nation that has a good number of tunnels and actually one of the world leading countries for, for tunneling. Um, interestingly, with Switzerland, uh, if you look back to, you know, obviously a neutral state, but if you look back to uh, their approach uh, during the Cold War, uh, they had extensive underground um, bunkers uh, throughout the country, uh, many of which, with, which hosted significant ar artillery batteries. Um, so actually, it's remarkable where a lot of these things um, are, are 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 hidden. Um, is Corsham Stone uh, still being worked? Uh, so not at Corsham Mine itself, but if you go to Corsham uh, and you drive towards the army camp, um, it depends what, uh, which side you're coming from, but uh, there certainly is a mine uh, still in operation there, uh, producing uh, dimension stone. So yes. Um, Let's see, Sandy. Um, are some of the references shown earlier for the Ministry of Defence also available for reading material? Um, some of those might be. There's actually quite a significant amount uh, online, open source. Um, you'll have to dig into sort of gov.uk to, to, to pull it out. And um, what's actually quite interesting is the amount of American material that's open source. Um, whether you're looking at uh, ATP, which are kind of the, their army training pamphlets, uh, or indeed uh, other pieces of uh, information produced by the asymmetric warfare group as was. Um, there's actually a huge amount out there in the public domain, so you, you need to just uh, jump on Bing or Google or whatever your your preference is for um, internet, internet searching and, and have a look there. Um, let's see, John. How do we suggest ideas into the specialist area? Is DASA the best route? Ah, good, good, good uh, use of... Uh, mention there. So DASA, the Defence Accelerator uh, Project. So DASA is very closely aligned uh, with uh, DSTL, DSTL being the UK equivalent equivalent, excuse me, of, of DARPA. And um, yeah, there's, there's a number of programs ongoing. Uh, frankly, if you've got a good idea, um, uh, you know, do feel free to get in touch. And you know, things like DASA is probably a good route to, uh, to getting that uh, to, to to get that looked at from an innovation point of view. Uh, we don't really have a DASA ru challenge running right now on sub T, um, but that may, may change in the future. So I guess watch this this space. Uh, Paul's question, this might not be answerable, but is use being made of advanced seismic and gravitometry for the detection and mapping of underground structures? Uh, well, the simple answer is yes. Um, and I can say that because it's in the public domain uh, certainly, if you look at what the Israeli Defense Forces is using, a number of the videos that they put out around exercise, uh, sorry, Operation Northern Edge, um, it was very clear that they were using seismic uh, vibrosize systems in order to gather data uh, to then analyze and generate targets that they could investigate via drilling. Um, so, yeah, hopefully that answers that question. Um, you mentioned only three of you, uh, very vulnerable in a military environment. Um, I, I think I get the gist of your, your point there. Um, I guess you could say we probably wouldn't all be sat in the same office at the same time, um, which would um, enhance our survivability, shall we say. Um, yeah, probably enough on that one. Um, let's see, Gareth. Uh, good evening, Gareth. How are you? 
Uh, clearly, in the past, it's been necessary to have mining skills deployed in a conflict environment. Many groups are actively using them today. Yes, indeed, they are. Uh, is it an area where we're potentially uh, essentially passive? Are we looking to be more proactive where required? Um, well, as I said, within the military geology cell, there's myself as an economic geologist who works in the mining sector. So I bring to bear uh, a set of skills uh, and, and knowledge and experience. Uh, and it's very possible that other, other uh, reservists throughout the British military or indeed our allied forces who work in the mining sector, they could bring to bear um, their experience, uh, possibly even a relatively short notice. The key there is therefore knowing um, what tools you have in the box, what knowledge exists uh, that you could put into, into practice in times of need. Uh, Andrew, the recent cave rescue in the Brecon Beaksons used a tech system cave link. Uh, brilliant. Thank you so much. That's uh, clarified that first question we had. Um, so obviously cave link is an, uh, the, ability, the, the mechanism through which to, to communicate that information. Wow. So we've cantered through those um, questions exceedingly quickly. Um, Tony, I'm very happy to um, answer any further questions if, if, if you can open up the floor any further. But Otherwise, um, probably remains for me for me to say uh, thank you very much um, for the opportunity to present to you this evening. Uh, it really is a most fascinating uh, uh, subject, um, and I think you will see more and more around this uh, in the coming months and years, um, for good or for bad, let's say. Well, Drew, that was fascinating. Thank you very much. <clears throat> We've got a thousand members who are fascinated in this subject, so yeah, you 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 preach to an audience which we're really very happy to listen to you. Anyway, on behalf of Subterranean Botanica, thank you very much indeed. You're very welcome, and uh, and thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you.